So shalom to everyone. My name is Aaron Lipkin, and we are uh, starting the fourth lecture uh, on the Joshua's Altar site online course. Um, and we've heard some really amazing lecturers in the past few weeks. Um, we, Shai Bar is an Israeli lecturer. Then we have we heard uh, Dr. Ralph Hawkins and Dr. Scott Stripling from the United States. And uh, today we're actually returning to Israel and we have the honor of listening to uh, Tzvi Konigsberg. So Tzvi Konigsberg sent me a very short bio, which I'm going to read, but then I'm going to read something else. So here is uh, Tzvi, I'll present Tzvi. For the past 40 years, Tzvi has been studying everything he could find relating to Mount Ibal, which he helped excavate and write about in the Lost Temple of Israel, which is a uh, an article or a book, Tzvi? Book. It's a book. Uh, it's called The Lost Temple of Israel uh, by Boston uh, Academic Studies Press, 2015. He also lectured on the topic in Hebrew at the Bible Lands Museum um, and at the University of Haifa, as well as uh, Harvard, believe it or not. So this is uh, uh, Tzvi's bio. And what I'm going to do now is definitely unplanned. I'm going to be opening uh, the book, A Nation Born, uh, which was written by no other than Professor Adam Zertal. And uh, in page 60, <clears throat> Adam Zertal is writing the following. Um, I produced a sheet of paper and drew a sketch of the edifice, a drawing that I have kept uh, uh, to this very day. It included the filled bama paved on the top, the two paved courtyards, the encircling parapet, and the double ramp. It was only a simple schematic sketch. Nevertheless, when Zvi Konigsberg saw it, he jumped as though he'd seen a ghost. I can't remember ever seeing a man turn so white so fast. He froze, staring and speechless, and began to turn red in the face. Then he dashed out of the room, only to return a few minutes later holding a small brown book. This was one of the six orders of the Mishnah. And Adam Zertal continues describing how Tzvi was so crucial in letting Adam Zertal understand that the structure that was found on Mount Ibal was no other than an Israelite altar. And uh, thanks to this, Adam Zertal's life changed and so did ours. So I really want to thank Tzvi for being there at that moment of time near Adam Zertal to show him um, the uh, sketches of the altar at the second temple period that uh, uh, really resembled, there was so, such a big resemblance to the structure that was excavated by Zertal on Mount Ival. And uh, since then, you know, Adam Zertal looked at uh, Tzvi Konigsberg, that moment, and he said, Tzvi, you understand what this means? This is Joshua's altar. And if this is Joshua's altar, then Joshua existed, and Moses existed, and the Exodus happened. And Tzvi looked at him and said, of course, what do you mean? So this was really thank, thanks to Tzvi Konigsberg. So without further ado, uh, Tzvi, we are anxiously waiting to hear your lecture. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I hope everybody hears me uh, clearly. Okay, look at the title. That story is absolutely true, by the way. I'll be presenting it in a second anyhow, so Aaron, save me some time and energy. Um, the title I've presented here is a new paradigm for the study of biblical archaeology. Now, what, what do I mean when I say something like that? When I was a child growing up in an Orthodox uh, day school in the United States, uh, my concept of the authorship, at least of the Pentateuch, was 
um, the good Lord standing on Mount Sinai with a uh, server, a very powerful uh, computer server, and sending Moses a PDF, which included the five books of Moses. Of course, we all, this was pre-computer days, of course. So we all know that that didn't happen, but how did it happen? When were these pages written? By whom? Why we know? We know that it was for the purpose of um, consolidating Israel under some kind of auspices of heavenly authority. Okay, let's see where this takes us. And I think, excuse me, that Mount Ebal will show us a new way of looking at this. We're going to be taking a trip today from Deuteronomy to Genesis. Usually you start at Genesis and go through Deuteronomy when you're talking about Pentateuch. We're going to do the opposite. Now, what are we going to do? You can, if that's clear, you can read that. How my meeting with a fledgling archeologist led to our discovery of the only item found in Israel mentioned in the five books of Moses, of course, which is the altar in Mount Ebal. How I came to the conclusion that it was actually a temple. How that conclusion affects our understanding of the Hebrew Bible and other things. And how I think, at least in my opinion, I found a smoking gun after 35 years of looking at this. Now, of course, there's no such thing as some very clever friends of mine who are important in the study of Bible and academia have explained to me countless times, there is no such thing as a certainty when you're talking about the humanities. But I think we've come pretty close. And let's see what I'm talking about. Rembrandt, well, what the heck is Rembrandt doing here? Rembrandt in 1656 painted this painting, which is his representation of Genesis 48. Genesis 48 is the chapter where Jacob, the patriarch, is about to pass away he's on his deathbed and he wants to bless all the children before he goes and the first to be blessed are the two sons of joseph manasseh and ephraim of course they're all dressed in turkish uh clothing which is what rembrandt knew represented the middle east and the uh, lady in question mrs joseph or Tsofnat Panach, uh, in biblical terms was not a part of the biblical description, but you see here Manasseh and Ephraim um, being blessed by Jacob. Mena uh, Ephraim, the younger, is the one on the right. You see there's a halo on his head, and you see Manasseh to the left is darker, and this, according to Rembrandt, uh, represented the transfer of the halo from the elder son Manasseh to the younger son Ephraim, and of course it was the change from Judaism to Christianity. This was Rembrandt's interpretation. Well, we'll see if Rembrandt was right or not. Okay, there's a phrase, the place that he will choose to put his name there. 22 times in the entire Bible and almost all in the book of Deuteronomy. Okay. It doesn't say, however, where this uh, site is. And both academia and tradition interpret it as the home of God. What's the home of God? Of course, the temple. Now, these are the boundaries of uh, the tribes as described in the book of Joshua. And we see this one here, if you see my arrow, the area of Manasseh west of the Jordan River. That was the area that uh, my good friend Adam Zertal uh, conducted a survey beginning in 1977, actually, not 78. And just to understand the uh, depth of this survey, there was an emergency survey carried out after the war in uh, 1967 when they didn't know what's going to be the, uh, the fate of Judea and Samaria, which they still don't know. And um, 
they discovered in the area that Adam, Adam covered in his survey 239 sites. Now, Adam's survey, which is continued by Shai Bar, who began the uh, lecture series here a few weeks ago, found over 3,000 sites, which means that we now, for the first time, have a really good idea of who lived where, when, and how in this very, very important biblical area. Extremely important work for which he should have gotten the Israel Prize many years ago, but there are politics involved and we won't go there. Okay, this is a survey map and these are the neighboring tribes. This is what the area looks like. This is the uh, village of Asiro Shamalia, which is the nearest one. So you get an, an idea of the landscape. Now, think we, we, you've seen this picture and I'm just introducing it uh, quickly. This was the site, the main area of the site before the excavation. And this is the pottery that was uh, discovered there. Very distinctive iron one, no question whatsoever which was corroborated by some uh, carbon-14 uh, tests as well. Adam came upon the site on uh, April 6, 1980. We met a year and a half later, and uh, through a long story, I was able to help him get the excavations off the ground. And on the 13th of October 1983, in the third season of the excavations, is the story that you just heard from uh, Aaron about him bringing me a picture. This is a much more sophisticated one by Len Rittmeyer. But as soon as I saw this, I had the first of my ideas on the site. I have one about every decade, I have an idea about the site. And I brought him the Mishnah the Tractate of Midoto Measurements, and the third chapter that describes the altar of the Second Temple and Josephus Flavius, the famous uh, historian during Ro the Roman period, who was actually priest and served in the temple, uh, corroborated this description uh, in the Mishnah. And this was what it looked like after we finished excavating. And this was after a reconstruction done a few years later. Okay, so we knew that we had a an altar. But what's the significance of it? I, you've seen this diagram in previous things. I just wanted to point out one thing, and I'm talking of, in relation to the concept of when these things were written. Now, everything relating to altars or temples or sacrifices and everything is considered by academia to be part of what they call source P, P standing for priests. According to most um, academics, and uh, the interesting thing is that there are disagreements across the board on all of these things. Nobody really has a d definitive clue on anything because all of the reasons and the assumptions that they make have been on the basis of philological concepts, language, you know, what language uh, comports to which part of whatever. And they try to make conclusions on the basis of that. But here we have a very, very interesting thing. Look at the top left corner over here, with, which looks like it's blank, but it's it's actually not blank because at the time of the excavation, it was a flat stone. Now, if you go to the book of uh, Leviticus, chapter 1, verse 11, you see a phrase in Hebrew, it's Yerecham is Bertafon, or the flank of the altar northwards. This is where they sacrifice. Now, what does that mean? In the second temple period, the sides of the altar were towards the winds of the earth. In this particular altar, it wasn't that way, but the northern corner here was exactly due north. In the second temple, the, the entire side here was north, and of it, in Ebal, it was off by uh, 45 degrees, and this was north, and this was due south. By the way, the only other place in the ancient Near East where uh, sacred buildings were built with this kind of concept of corners to the winds of the earth was Mesopotamia. 
indicating for the first time some kind of evidence that the cultic origin of the Israelites was Mesopotamia, just like the good book says. Now, what's interesting here is that the second temple had a table just about here where I'm showing you, just off to the side of the north where the animals were sacrificed. But over here, in Mount Ebal, they sacrificed actually at the corner, at the precise corner. In other words, the biblical description describes something like what happened at Mount Ebal and not the interpretation that was given later uh, during the time of the Second Temple period, which indicates that the biblical description is describing a very early phenomenon, unlike what most academics think today, that it's describing something way into the Second Temple era. I hope I didn't lose you with all that, but it's very interesting, at least to me. Next. Of course, so we have an altar, and it's at Mount Ebal, and it's during the time of the settlement period. They open the Bible, you go to Deuteronomy 27, and let's see some of the features of Deuteronomy 27. First of all, it says, Moses and the elders of Israel. This is the only command in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, where the elders participated in a command with Moses. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, something very serious is coming down here. Next. The day you cross the Jordan doesn't necessarily mean that particular day, you mean close to that day. And most uh, historians consider Iron One uh, the period of the settlement, so that works as well. You will set up large stones, plaster them with plaster. And you saw evidence of the plaster previously with uh, Shai. And you'll establish, oops, sorry. You'll set these stones up, which I commend you in Mount Ebal, very important. You'll see why in a moment. And you will write upon them the entire Torah, which we did not find. Otherwise, you would have heard about it somehow. And you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, which, of course, is exactly what we found. And make it whole stones that you don't uh, cut in any way. So everything fits so far. This is an interesting phrase. You shall rejoice before the Lord. Why it's interesting, we'll see in a few moments. Just keep this in mind, rejoicing before the Lord. And possibly most important, this day you have become the nation of the Lord your God. According to the Bible, this time and this place was the creation of Israel as a nation. Now, strangely enough, only one a uh, traditional Jewish commentator called the Metziv Naftali Tzviuda Berlin, who was considered basically the first Zionist rabbi in the 19th century, um, said that this is exactly what the Torah means, and this time and place at Mount Ebal, during this ceremony of the blessing and the curse, this is when Israel became a nation. There we go. Now, it says that tribes should go on Mount Grizim, Al Har Grizim in Hebrew, and Behar Eval. Now, the Behar Eval is repeated twice in verse 4 of uh, Deuteronomy 27 and in verse 13. Why the discrepancy between Grizim and Ebal? I asked, well, I'll tell you what I did. You'll see it here in a moment. Boom, that was my idea. <laughs> Next. When was this chapter written? Okay. The site in Mount Ebal was deliberately covered up, like you saw, and never revisited. How do I know? Because there's no evidence at all of any pottery later than Iron One at the site. We discovered the plaster that you saw pictures of with Shai, and it was buried inside the altar. And the plaster pit, I actually found the plaster pit 
and um, Adam forgot to make a note of exactly where it was. So I have to go up there again one day because Shai told me it's very important to find it because plaster can only be a part of a cultic site. So I'll be going up to Ebel one of these days and we'll be looking again. Now the big question, how did anyone who actually didn't, who didn't see the site when it was active, know that it was in Mount Ebal and that plaster was an integral part of the ceremony. Everything was covered up. The plaster was inside the covered up altar. So how could they know 600 years later? During the time of Josiah, which is the time that uh, academia basically places the writing of the core of Deuteronomy, how could they know 600 years later of these details? I asked a good friend, and I'm going to be name dropping um, a number of times, but not because I need to name drop. <coughs> Excuse me, but I want you to get an idea of the people I consulted with to examine these issues, and that some of them were quite serious people. So, this was my conclusion that this text of Deuteronomy 27 and the balance of the original core of Deuteronomy are a product of the era of Ibal 1200 BCE. Now, why is this significant? Why is this? If you go to a book in Hebrew, which is translated actually into English as well by Professor Alexander Rofeu, who was uh, Professor Emeritus at Hebrew University, Go to the first page is the introduction. He says, source D, which is what we're talking about, is definitely dated to the time of Josiah, which uh, this is a story in the uh, book of two Kings, uh, chapters 22 and 23, tells of the uh, high priest Hilkiah going into the temple, finding a scroll, bringing it to Shaphan, the scribe, who's, uh, by the way, whose bulla, whose insignia was found in recent years right near uh, the Western Wall. And he goes to the King Josiah. Josiah uh, tears his clothing in a sign of mourning and proceeds to do something very significant, to destroy all the places of worship and sacrifice outside of the Temple Mount. What did he do? So in 1805, a Swiss priest named uh, Devete took a look at this story in uh, at the end, towards the end of the Book of Kings, took a look at the Book of Deuteronomy, and he said in French, la même chose, it's the same thing. We're talking about centralization of the cult, which is something that is part and parcel of Deuteronomy. Why? Because the idea of the, the place that he will choose, the phrase I referred to previously, is the center of the law code of Deuteronomy chapters uh, 12 to 26. And what did he come to the conclusion that the people Josiah's scribes wrote the book of Deuteronomy, placed it in the mouth of Moses to give it the historical uh, sanctity. And that was that. And of course, why did they do it? To sell Coca-Cola at the Zion Gate and to draft soldiers at the Jaffa Gate and to do all these things that a uh, political leader is interested in doing. And that way you get the people three times a year to visit this place and you're able to hit them for taxes and draft them into the military, et cetera, et cetera. And this idea is almost exclusively the prevalent idea of uh, the academic uh, attitude towards the Pentateuch. And what does Professor Rofe write? He says, this is the most solid and absolute dating of any of the biblical sources. And all the rest are dated relative to the dating of D. So D is off by 600 years. So is everything else. Let me just emphasize what you're saying. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm. Yeah, go ahead. You. You're saying, that the academic world today, uh, when you go to, to learn Bible in the academic world, what you hear is that the book of Deuteronomy is actually an invention 
that was made by King Josiah approximately 800, BC. Yes. 800 years after the supposedly time 600 yeah when it was supposed to happen right okay just exactly just, correct just so we were clear about about that and of course there's no uh, that attitude takes into account that nothing that in the book of Deuteronomy that's recorded actually has any kind of historicity i mean it's all made up many 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 hundreds of years later now i took this to this idea of mine to professor frank mokros professor uh, frank mokros uh, was already retired. He was at Harvard, head of the Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations, and uh, the author of the most important work uh, in biblical studies anywhere in the world, the Canaanite, uh, uh, well, I have it here on my shelf, but it's been printed over 30 times, and he uh, showed the um, a good historical analysis of the beginnings of Israel, and this is what he wrote me. I am now convinced that the main ruin is an ancient altar and that the lore about Ebal are among the earliest historical materials preserved in Deuteronomy, never mind how. In other words, he did not have a really a uh, good reason that this, that my, uh, to uh, he had no good reason to object to, to the reasoning I presented him, which you just saw. He said, basically, you're right, which was interesting. Now, the his the person who succeeded him in the uh, chair at Harvard, it's by the way, it's the um, Thomas Hancock uh, Chair of Bible at Harvard, which is the third oldest uh, academic chair in the United States. Uh, Thomas Hancock was the uncle of uh, the guy from the Declaration of Independence with a nice signature, John Hancock. Uh, his successor, uh, Peter Machinist, uh, sent me to read uh, three books on the uh, topic of how oral concepts eventually become historical literature. And none of these uh, volumes enable interpreting the idea of the in Mount Ebal and the idea of the plaster in any other way. In other words, I, I was making sense. Now, to make it even more so, complicated. So, sorry, sorry, sorry to stop you. This is revolutionary what you're saying. You're saying that the discoveries of the plaster and the, the fact that the altar is situated not on top of Mount Gerizim at the summit, right. but rather on the slopes of the mountain, the way it's reflected in the book of Deuteronomy and Joshua proves that this is original from the period where this was made. and that the Let, Let's not use the word proof, but it, it suggests. Okay, it strongly suggests that uh, this is very, very, very early. And not yes. an invention by King Josiah. Precisely. That's exactly my, when I'm trying, the point that I'm trying to bring across. Now, you've, you, you all have uh, English uh, translations of the uh, Pentateuch in front of you. Let's see how they dealt with it. The, there are two times in, uh, like, which I mentioned, Deuteronomy 27, 4 and 13, which use the phrase in Hebrew, Behar Eval, which is in Mount Ebal, which is the way we found it on a slope of the mountain, not on top of the mountain and not beneath the mountain. These are the 10 most popular translations in English. Not a single one got both of the notations correct. The first first X means they're wrong, Y means they're right. And why, what does it mean right? That they translated B as in. Not a single one of the 10 most popular translations got this business right. Now, only the good Lord knows how many other things are mistranslated throughout all English translations, but we won't go there. Okay, 
Now, of course, we go to Joshua 8, 30 to 35, which is the enactment of the ceremony described in uh, Deuteronomy 27. And we see that uh, Joshua built an altar again in Mount Ebal, reflecting the exact location. And this is interesting. All Israel and its elders watch us from either side, opposite the Levitical priest, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Hello, the Ark of the Covenant all of a sudden appears here in the book of Joshua, which got me thinking. Then we have in Leviticus uh, chapter one, the animals that have to be sacrificed, the bones of which we discovered. I talked about that. Uh, we'll skip that. Now, there's another interesting thing here. When you go to Judges chapter six, you see, take, uh, that's the prophet uh, Gideon, uh, the judge Gideon, okay? And take the meat and the unleavened, place them on the rock. In other words, the angel of the Lord touches the meat and the unleavened bread, which is, of course is a sacrifice, and fire flared, flared up and burnt them. And what did they do there? Look at verse 24. So, Gideon built an altar to the Lord there. The altar that we have at Ebal, like Shai explained, and Scott spoke about that as well with the two layers. There's an original layer, and then they built the big thing that we dug up. The same, Gideon was in the same tribe of Menashe. In other words, when you're going, this is a blueprint what we have is the blueprint for what is being described in the book of Judges, which is really an amazing feature. In other words, if you want to do an altar the right way, what you do is first have some kind of dedication ceremony, in our opinion, like the round circle that's at the bottom uh, of the altar. And on top of that, they built an altar, and we see the exact parallel here in the book of Judges, which is simply amazing. Of course, we think it's based on the uh, the concept of the structure, the architecture is based on the ziggurat of uh, Mesopotamia. Let me just stop you there for a second. Sorry, I'm, I'm sure. doing too much. Uh, if you can go back to the ziggurat, um, we can see that there is a similarity between the altar on Mount Ibal and the temples of uh, Babylon and Assyria. Uh, in other words, Right. What you're saying, Tzvi, is that the, the, there might be, that's how archaeologists say, they're very careful, there might be uh, a, a Babylonian, a Syrian uh, um, uh, 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 effect on the architecture of Joshua's altar or the... No, that fits that perfectly good. with the idea of the corner, uh, corner going north-south. But what you're hinting is that the the tradition of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that are coming from that area, the area of Assyria and Babylon, they're it's bringing... It's only Abraham. I mean, with them Abraham, that, Jacob, Isaac, Isaac stuck around. <laughs> right. So they're bringing with them that type of architecture. Yes. Miraculously continues on with the Israelites as they go into Egypt. And when they come out of Egypt to come into Israel, they're bringing the tradition of building a Babylonian or a Syrian temple or all uh, now you're getting you're getting into a complicated thing. The okay. question is who, who went that. out to Egypt and who went that this is really we'll leave that for the next generation, maybe. All right, let's take a look at this is an aerial uh, photography of the site. You see the area that I'm uh, pointing at. And this was done in 1985, a topographic map. Now look what we have here. We have an outer wall and we have an inner wall. And inside the inner wall, we have the altar and the courtyards, etc. And as soon as I saw this, which was done by the way, by Tzvi Lederman, he's uh, directing excavations in Bet Shemesh, if any of you visit Israel, visit their very interesting excavations. And uh, as soon as I saw this picture, another idea came to mind. And this was the idea that came to mind, which is now in the Israel Museum. This is a model 
because of the second temple in Jerusalem. Look, you have an outer wall, you have an inner wall, and all the important things happened inside the inner wall. So I said, oh, maybe this is a temple. So I went to ask a very clever gentleman, Benjamin Mazar, who was president of the uh, Hebrew University for a decade. And uh, if you don't know who he was, this is what he did. He did the excavations along the Western Wall in Jerusalem after the war in 1967. Now, let me just stop a minute here and talk about Professor Mazar. I met him for the first time that night of October 13th, 1983, when we compared the diagrams and saw that we had an altar in Mount Ibal, Adam uh, phoned Professor Mazar to tell him about it and asked me to pick up Professor Mazar in Jerusalem the next day and bring him to the site, which I agreed to do. So here I go knocking on the door of Professor Benjamin Mazar, the great scholar. He was already retired. And uh, he says, sit down, have a cup of coffee. He's making me a cup of coffee, which I thought was absurd. I thought, there's no way if I go to the retired president of Harvard or Yale or Columbia or anything like that, that they're going to sit me down and make me a coffee. It doesn't work. Anyhow, we go on the way to the car, and he says, oh, I forgot something. I said, what did you forget? Well, I forgot my Bible. I said, oh, we have plenty. We'll give you... Is my, no, no, not this. Let me go get my Bible. He, I don't understand what he's, why he insisted on that. He comes back a few moments later with a plain, simple Bible like they give out to all of the soldiers in the military, but he opens it up and I see the dedication. The dedication was from his brother-in-law, uh, Yitzhak Ben Tzvi, who was the second president of the state of Israel. And he said to me, something I'll never forget, I never go to a biblical site without carrying this Bible with me. So that was why he ran back to the house. Anyhow, uh, I had one distinct advantage over those of my generation in Israel in that I spoke Yiddish. And Pro Professor Mazar spoke an excellent Yiddish. And he loved doing it, so we became good friends. And I, after that first meeting, I went to his home uh, on the average of once a month for a decade until he passed away. And he would give me a pile of books. And if he didn't have the books at home, he'd give me a list to look up in the library. Go home, read this, come back, we discuss. This went on for a decade. and. He taught me everything I know, or most everything I know. And it was a wonderful relationship. Okay, so this is what he told me early on in Hebrew, but I translated it. If you want to look at this thing seriously, you have to look at it in every way possible and go through all the range of disciplines that this subject touches upon, which is why he told me basically there's no way on earth that you're going to ever be able to do this in an academic framework because it's much too big. This is big picture stuff and academia uh, by its nature, especially in recent years, narrows its uh, focus on very, very narrow areas and not on a big picture. Mm. He was right. Okay, so what did I do? I open the Bible. I look at Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 12. It says, go to my place at Shiloh, where I first placed my name. In other words, placing the name of God, like we saw the phrase in Deuteronomy, okay? Uh, it does not necessarily mean Jerusalem, because Jeremiah said we're talking about Shiloh. Next, we go to, this is in Hebrew, not translated, but it's the tractate of Zavachim, or Sacrifices in the Mishnah, chapter 14, which gives the Mishnah's idea of the important holy sites of Israel. And, of course, it omits Mount Ebal. Now, why does it omit Mount Ebal? Yeah. Now, it, I just want to point out that it, they omit Mount Ebal, despite the fact that the book of Joshua, which I just showed you, 
said that the ark was present there. In other words, if the ark was present there, this was a big deal and an important place. Why leave it out? But then you have to remember that the Mishnah was written around 200 AD. Around 200 AD is the time that the Samaritans were in the area of Shechem. And the rabbis who wrote the Mishnah and the Samaritans were not on the best of terms, to say the least. And consequently, I think that the omission of Ibel in this list is very simply the fact that they did not want to emphasize any site that's in the area of the Samaritans. That's complete conjecture and guesswork on my part, but I would bet that it's true. Mm. Uh, this is funny. This is a podcast, um, a historical podcast of uh, a modern one, of course, of uh, talking about the Ark, and they also neglect uh, to mention Mount Ebal. Now, during the course of my trying to figure all this out, I con contacted Professor Menachem Haran, may he rest in peace. He was professor of Bible at Hebrew University, and he wrote Temples and Temple Services in Ancient Israel, published in Oxford in uh, 1978. And he defined these four criteria of a temple. The place and the institutions, what is the place it's Mount Ebal, what is the institutions we're talking about, are the Levitical priests and the um, the personnel, I mean, are the Levitical priests and the acts that they're doing is the ceremony of the blessing of the curse and sacrificing sacrifices. And the occasion is this huge idea of the blessings and the curses. You know, all these criteria define a temple. By the way, Maimonides in Laws of the Chosen House basically uses the same uh, concepts in defining an Israelite temple. So Professor Aran, wonderful man, he said, eh, maybe yes, maybe no. Until one day I told you to remember a phrase that I quoted before from Deuteronomy 27, Rejoice before the Lord. When you open Professor Aran's book on page 26, he says where it says, rejoice before the Lord, that specifically indicates a temple. So I told him, I was once, this is a true story. I was walking, uh, I was uh, in Jerusalem on the Sabbath, and I just bumped into him by accident walking in the neighborhood of Rochavia. And I had just come upon this, again, I read his book, I don't know, about 10 times. And I said, listen, this is what you wrote. He said, well, maybe you're right. He never sent that to me in writing, but it was nice to hear after five years of discussing the subject with the most authoritative person in the field. Okay, this again is the incense altar that was covered previously, which also is a part of a larger thing than just a plain altar with sacrifices itself indicates some kind of serious cultic activity. Uh, Professor Dan uh, Danell, this is was his doctorate actually, studies in the name Israel. He said he did a study of uh, the name Israel versus the name Jacob throughout the Bible. And he came to the conclusion that you see here, even if it is not directly stated that Ebal is the place which Yahweh chooses, there are quite clear indications of this. Now we come to Sandra Richter, who got her doctorate from uh, my friend, Professor Peter Machinist at Harvard. And she found an interesting thing. The, uh, in Akkadian, there's a phrase, Sakanu Shamu. Sakanu Shamu is the equivalent of the Hebrew, the Shaken Shmo, to enshrine his name there, which is throughout Deuteronomy. And she, because of this uh, concept, she also comes to the conclusion that the, uh, of the centrality of uh, Ebal, Israel's first central sanctuary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, this is a view from the north. We think that this was a corral for the animals. The priest took them up these ceremonial steps and to the corner here where they conducted the slaughter and then on top the sacrifice. Uh, this is a very common, uh, uh, the Calorimpithus is the most common iron one 
uh, jar, and this was found in abundance, and he buried in these installations that Shai mentioned in the first lecture. And then uh, this was discussed already, the uh, idea of the uh, sil gold and silver earrings that we found there, which are recall at least the Egyptian uh, shape. Now, uh, this you saw before, but there's one thing that wasn't mentioned that I'd like to mention. I spoke to um, Daphna Bentor. She's the uh, leading Egyptologist in Israel about this scarab that was found belonging to the, the third. She said this can be considered a foundation deposit. The foundation deposit is a deposit of something of great value, which is placed at a, at a cultic site, which solidifies completely the identification of the Ibal site as a cultic site. That's a very, very important uh, point. Okay, Deuteronomy 1130. Are they not beyond the Jordan west of the road, da, 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 opposite Gilgal? Now, what is opposite Gilgal? The uh, interpreters, the commentators on this had a very, very great problem because the Gilgal usually associated with Joshua is where near Jericho, and this is way far away from Jericho. Rashi here says that the word mul, which is the biblical word used here for opposite, means in this case means far away from. Now, what is it far away? What's far away is Rashi's explanation of this thing from plain logic. There was a rabbi Eliezer in the Jerusalem Talmud <coughs> who saw this uh, as so strange as thinking that there were two little hills near uh, Jericho that were designated as Ibal and Grizim, and that's where everything took place because they couldn't picture what was going on. So one day, Adam um, takes me for a little ride in the Jeep after a day of excavations, along with Judy Dekel, who did the uh, drawings that you saw up to now. And we go to this site called El Unuk, which is the necklace. And I stand there and look in the direction of Mount Ibal and bingo, I see the altar that we excavated. In other words, the Bible here is describing an exact place at an exact time. Very simple explanation if you happen to know that Gilgal does not necessarily mean a particular site. It means a particular type of site. And the type of site are these footprints that I assume Aaron will be talking about a bit next week, which were found in the Jordan Valley. And Ibal is also in the shape of a footprint. And this particular one, when you look opposite, you see uh, Mount Ibal. Now, Genesis 12, verse 6, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the Oak of Moreh. We saw the Oak of Moreh here as well in Deuteronomy 11.30. Okay, those are the only two places where Elon Moreh, the Oak of Moreh, uh, is mentioned in the Bible. What is the Oak of Moreh? The... According to the verse in uh, Deuteronomy 11.30, it has to be somewhere between the Gilgal. It is a progression. That uh, verse follows um, the progression along what is known as the Tirza Valley, or the Arabs call it uh, Wadi Farah. You start at the Jordan River and you progress towards Shechem. Now, when you get to Unuk, which we found, what's the next site that contains any remnants of that particular period of the Iron One? There's a place 
on this mountain of Kabir, which Shai uh, Bar said they're going to be uh, surveying uh, next year, called Sheikh Bilal. Bilal was the muazin, the cantor, so to speak, of Muhammad. And according to Muslim tradition, until about a century ago, they used to go there on various Muslim holidays to celebrate. Hundred years ago, roughly, they came to the conclusion that Bilal died in Iraq, and this site has no significance, really. And they stopped coming there. And Adam Zertal came to the site and saw a Temenos. Temenos is a wall encircling a sacred place with pottery ranging from Middle Bronze to all the way through to the Roman period. In other words, this was a site that was visited constantly over all those centuries. There are oak trees there. And we spoke to botanists who told us that if there are oak trees there now, there were oak trees there 3,000 years ago as well. And Adam th thought that this particular site of Sheikh Bilal was actually the Elon Moray that the Bible is mentioning here. Now, why is that interesting from a modern perspective? When Begin uh, was prime minister, uh, Ariel Sharon at one point was his uh, minister of agriculture, was also responsible for the Jewish settlements in the West Bank. There was a group uh, calling themselves Elon Moray. They were sitting in a place south of Shechem called Rujayev, and the Supreme Court decided that Rujayev was uh, privately owned Arab lands. They later changed that ruling, but it was too late. And Sharon had to decide what to do with the homes of this group of uh, Israelites, took helicopters from the military and plunked them on the mountain of Jebel Kabir. In other words, he returned the group calling themselves Elon Moray by complete fluke and accident to the biblical Elon Moray which is probably the greatest historical fluke of all time. Okay. So now, 10 years, I'm discussing all this with Professor Mazar, and he tells me, Yiddish, yo, yo, nish, nish. you know, maybe you're right, maybe you're not. And then we come back to where I promised you in the beginning we would get to, is the idea of Rembrandt. By the way, this painting is in uh, the uh, Museum of the City of Kassel in Germany to this day. It cost me 38 euro, euro <laughs> to be able to uh, use it in any kind of uh, book or presentation. What's going on here? What is the story of Rembrandt? Genesis 48, okay. So what's happening and Joseph, knows his pup is sick and he takes his two sons with him in Asher and Ephraim and he sets them up. There's a very meticulous description in the Bible how he sets up the uh, elder son Manasseh opposite the right hand, the more important hand of his father Jacob and the left hand he puts uh, uh, Ephraim and what does Jacob do? Boom, he pulls the switcheroo and he places his right hand on top of the head of Ephraim and his left thumb. And that. Now see what happens, see how intricate it is. Joseph sees that his father is doing, he says, Pop, what the heck are you doing? Okay, and he tries to remove his father's hand. But Jacob says, no, no, don't worry about it. And I know Manasseh will become a, important in all this, but his younger brother will be more important. Da, da, da. Why? Now, what I, it, it, this is really funny, though. And then he gives him a blessing, which, by the way, uh, Jewish families around the world still bless their sons every Friday evening. Uh, may the Lord make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. And this is verse 20 in chapter 48. And he placed Ephraim before Manasseh. In other words, the Bible is telling us, if you don't know what the heck is going on here, this whole chapter is meant to show the importance of Ephraim more than Manasseh. 
Now, watch this. Adam Zertal um, thought that the site at Ibal, which is in the area of Manasseh, began to function between 1250 and 1220 BC. I know Scott uh, disagrees, but we'll leave that for another century. Um, but when did it end? He thinks it ended at 1150 BC. Why did, does he think it ended 1150 BC? Because a certain type of pottery, a uh, cooking pot, uh, which stops, uh, which begins to appear, excuse me, from 1150 BC and is not found at all in Ipal. So he figures that that's the, uh, time that the site was stopped, uh, they stopped the use of the site. And what did they do? They deliberately covered it up. By the way, in the tractate of Sota and the Talmud, if you want to look it up on uh, page 32, side one, uh, Rashi actually uh, says that they covered, uh, he uses the word in Hebrew, satruha, which means to cover it up uh, completely. They cover the altar. How Rashi knew this, only God knows. Anyhow, there's a site that we're all familiar with called Shiloh. And on the 14th of October, when I was returning Professor Mazar back to his home in Jerusalem, it was along Route 60, which is the King's Highway, basically. Um, we passed Shiloh, and I said, oh, maybe let's go visit Israel Finkelstein who uh, was excavating Shiloh at the time. And I asked Finkelstein, among other things, when did Shiloh begin to function as an Israelite cultic center? And guess what he told me? 1150 BC, precisely the time that Ibal ended. In other words, this, the crossing of the arms, in my opinion, of Genesis 48, is a story which represents the transfer of the central holy site of Israel from Manasseh, Mount Ebal, to Shiloh of the tribe of Ephraim. Now, how else can we see that? Where else is that substantiated? We go to Genesis 49, verse 10. In the blessing of the son Judah, it says uh, in Hebrew, Al Katamim, until the coming of Shiloh when nations gather. Nations gather is a loose translation. Nobody really knows what Katamim means. But Shiloh, as I will write here, is a vital element in the blessings of Jacob. In other words, Context. Context is a very important idea in history. If you put things in context, you have a much, much better idea of what you're talking about. And if my interpretation is correct, then we know that this particular chapter was authored with the concept of the transfer of the central holy site of Israel and around 1100 BC. And this is the first time there's been any kind of uh, contextual handle on this particular chapter. If you go to all kinds of lectures, which I've gone to ad infinitum and mainly ad nauseum, uh, describing uh, concepts of the entire Joseph saga, uh, this is way, way, way earlier than what most people think. Okay, this is... Um, well, we'll leave this alone. Okay, Exodus 15, you're all uh, familiar with that. Uh, the Song of the Sea. Uh, this is probably the earliest known biblical text around 12th century BC. It talks of the temple of God on the mountain. Ebal was the only known game in town at the time. And what the Song of the Sea is probably talking about is Mount Dibal. Now, uh, I wrote an article about this. Those who are interested in uh, the Torah.com, look up my name and you'll see an article relating to that because I think the Song of the Sea is describing the same entrance 
uh, along the Valley of Tirza that Deuteronomy 11.30, which we covered before, is describing, which is a very interesting thing. If I'm right, I'm making history. Okay, last but not least, tell you some good stories and we'll end there. The four wise, yeah. Okay, Cheskel Kaufman was a great scholar at the Hebrew University, probably the most prominent scholar um, ever in the area of Bible. He wrote something called The History of the Israelite Belief, which was condensed into one volume in English by Moshe Greenberg, but is in six big fat volumes in Hebrew, and I read them all many times. But what's interesting, he set out to uh, contradict the concepts of Julius Wellhausen of uh, Prologomena fame, who wrote this Prologomena, which is the introduction to the Hebrew Bible, which uh, defined his idea of the different sources of the Pentateuch, especially. And Kaufman disagreed with Wellhausen on all of them except for one. And the one idea that Kaufman agreed with Wellhausen was on source D, which he also agreed it's probably from the time of Josiah. Now, if Kaufman had been hearing what you have heard this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are, it would turn out that Kaufman was right in making all the sources much, much earlier than the conventional theories that are accepted in academia to this very day. That's Kaufman. Yigel Yadin came to the site in, uh, I don't remember, it was 85 or 80, I think it was 85. And he looked around and puffed on his pipe and said, where's the dump? Now, I took this to understand that he saw exactly what I saw, that this was this had everything that the Bible attributes to a temple site, but the dump, the idea, in Hebrew, taking the refuse out from outside the camp. He died a few months later, the season after he passed away. We actually found the dump along the northeast wall, just outside the wall, outer wall of the enclosure, a big hole filled with ashes and bones. And so we found what Yadin was worrying about. Yair Zakovich, a professor of Bible at Hebrew University, when in one of my discussions with Professor Mazar, I said, listen, what do you think about Deuteronomy 27? Is it part and parcel of the early core of Deuteronomy or is it an outlier? And he said, there's a young man who really knows his stuff, go ask him. And this was Professor Zakovich at the time, this is the mid eighties. And I went to ask him, he said, no, it's part and parcel. So 15 years later, um, I was in Boston for many years, and Professor Zakovich came, comes to Boston to be a guest at a certain synagogue, so I went to uh, hear him speak, and I went up to him uh, afterwards and said, uh, I introduced myself and said, listen, we had spoken uh, all those years ago, and I'd like to, your opinion about some ideas that I have about this, he said, sure, send it to me. So I sent it to him, what I didn't know at the time, he was actually in Berkeley and I was sending it to Jerusalem. So a year and a half later, when he finally got back to Jerusalem, he sent me a long uh, email apologizing that he didn't get back to me. He said, wait a little while, three weeks later, I, I get an email. This is my home number. This is my office number. When you're here, call me. I did met him and I asked him about all the points that I've spoken to you about this evening. He said, it's entirely likely and we've been discussing the, this issue for the past 21 years. And this year, he happened to have received the Israel Prize, uh, which is our equivalent of the Nobel here in Bible. And we will hopefully be discussing this for the next 20 years. Uh, Yoel Rappel, this is a cute story. Nothing academic, but very nice. Uh, he used to do the uh, commentary on the weekly portion of the Bible on Israel radio, which I used to listen to while I was in Boston. And I'm listening to the 
commentary on the, the portion of the Bible, Kitavo, which includes chapter 27 of Deuteronomy. And what is he doing in describing Deuteronomy 27? He's reading what Aaron just read to you before from uh, Adam Zertal's book, Birth of a Nation, where I found the uh, Mishnah and brought to him and everybody got excited, etc. And two days later, I was listening again to Israel Radio, which I used to do a lot in Boston. And I hear another uh, program and Rappel is being interviewed and is saying that he's actually in Boston at the moment. I said, oh, he's in Boston. Let me find this guy. So where do you find someone who does biblical commentary? You find him in the synagogue on a Friday night. So I went to the synagogue on a Friday night. Someone pointed out to me who he is. I said, hello, you've been talking about me on the radio last week. And for the seven years that we shared being in Boston, we met or spoke every single day. And I was just at his house last week. Okay, cute story, right? So let's get serious again. The historical background of the core of Deuteronomy is around the time that Ebal was active. And this puts into question that the, the idea of D being created during the time of Josiah, which means that hundreds, if not thousands of books and you know, probably tens of thousands of articles um, are questionable. Let's put it that, be generous. I think that the builders of the Baal Temple came from Egypt. Why? Not only the scarab is less of an indication, but the earrings are a strong indication. And this comes back to the idea, I think, Aaron, you're going to be talking about the footprints next week a bit, right? Uh, actually not. Uh, we're going to speak you're about okay. them so the, in the next the online. Footprints and foot, the footprints that we identify as the Gilgalim, uh, as they mentioned, different vengeance of Gilgal have a very, very, very strong implication of an Egyptian source. It's very likely, logically, yeah, that these people came from Egypt. It's not, I wouldn't say it 100%, but I say very strong indications. And this is a very uh, interesting thing. 3,000 years, Jerusalem, Jerusalem's theological importance was a direct result of his identification as the place that he will choose. And since we saw here that maybe Ibal is the actually the original place that he will choose, if you think uh, I have an answer to that, you have another thought coming. <laughs> That's already beyond my, above my pay scale. This is nice. An afterthought. Okay, it says in the law code when it's talking about uh, placing the name of God, it says uses the word l'shakem shmo, which is uh, reminiscent of the Akkadian sakhan of shamo, and the other one is l'sum shmo to place his name there. One is enshrine his, his name, and the other one is place his name. Now there's another phrase im yerchak mimchamakom. If the place is far from you, what does it mean if the place is far from you? You don't want to carry the poor animal uh, for days on end until the place of the sacrifice. So what do you do? You go to the place of the area of the temple, you buy an animal there, and uh, that's that. So why, how does this work? In the, an article by Professor Zakovich in 1973, long time ago, he said that L'shaken Shmo is the earlier layer of Deuteronomy and L'sum was a layer, later layer of Deuteronomy. And what was also part of that later layer was if the place is far from you, okay? So L'shaken, the earlier one, there is no provision for taking money to the site of the temple buying an animal. When do we have that? At a later opportunity. Now watch this. This is a map of the Iron One sites in the survey of Adam Zertal. This is the area of Nablus Oshchem and of course Mount Ibal, exactly at the center, equidistant 
from all of the sites of settlement. <coughs> what happens here? You don't, the earliest stage of Deuteronomy happens here, where you don't have, you don't need a provision for carrying money to the temple because it's really not a big distance from the furthest point to the temple area of Ebal. Once you move down to Shiloh, way down here, then it's pretty far from up here. And then you need a provision for what to do. And the Bible provides in this later phrase a solution of what to do, taking money to the area of the temple and there buying the animal for sacrifice. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but it makes sense, I think. Okay, now I, I told you about the smoking gun. Oh, goodness, I'm running late. Joshua 9.27. I went to Beersheba to talk to uh, Professor uh, Gilad, who wrote some uh, commentaries on uh, Deuteronomy that were pretty close to my ideas. And the next day, he sends me an email. He said, look at Joshua 27. I look at Joshua 27. It's a story of the Gibeonites. I, those who, of you who are familiar with the Bible, you know what I'm talking about. And look what it says at the end. It says, um, for the altar of God to this day at the place that he will choose. This is the only mention of the place that he will choose outside the book of Deuteronomy. I said, holy cow, what is the place that he will choose? What is the altar? So I asked a friend of mine uh, who had access to these uh, academic databases, find me everything you can on uh, Joshua 9, I looked up and I found an interesting article on Joshua 9 written by uh, Dr. Wolfish. And now what did she write? She wrote something very interesting. It was uh, published in this um, uh, series of uh, magazine called Megadim uh, in Hebrew uh, by the Herzog College of Alonshfurt. Anyhow, volume 45. She said that the entirety of nine, of Joshua nine, and the end of Joshua eight, which is the story of the blessing and the curse, they are one literary historical piece. In other words, the place that he would choose that they're talking about and the altar that they're talking about is Mount Ebal, and consequently, the place that he will choose is Mount Ebal by default, because there's nothing else that it could be at that particular time. And this pretty much is a smoking gun for the entire theory that you heard today. Okay. Thank you. Thank now, you. if any of you are curious about anything, you can ask me now. And of course, um feel free to email me and if you lose this contact Aaron and he'll get in touch with me and be happy to answer anything and everything and I promise you I don't have an answer for everything <laughs> okay thank you but, thank you so much uh this is uh, the time if you want to ask questions uh, on the chat uh briefly we are kind of late so if you have any urgent uh, questions to ask uh, Tzvi, please feel free to do that right now at the chat box. Um, and just uh, while you're doing that, I just want to point out again, uh, Adam Zertal's uh, excavations show that the site of Joshua's altar was uh, active for many years. I believe that Zertal claims that it was uh, uh, active for 70 years. Now, this is, this is not something that the Bible mentions. All we know is that there is a ceremony that's being done, uh, uh, you know, on Mount Ibal and Mount Gerizim. Uh, we all believe that this is something that will, uh, that is probably one or two days, not more than that. Yet Zertal's uh, discovery of the altar shows that the altar was active for many years, for 70 years. And I think that this is, again, one of the cases where archaeology really sheds new light on the biblical 
text and the biblical story, uh, and and we understand that that no, the altar was active for many years, and I, I believe that this really corresponds with what uh, Tzvi presented today, that the altar was not a one day or two day event, uh, and then later on they just moved on to other places of worship, but uh, that actually Ibal was intended to be a temple, a place of worship for many years, um, and, uh, and that the, the, what's mentioned in Joshua 9 actually represents an, a second level of use for that altar after the ceremony of the blessing of the curses, this becomes Mizbeach Adonai, or the altar of Adonai, as it says in Joshua 9, at the end of the story of the Gibeonites. So again, a, an amazing uh, uh, understanding by Tzvi of this uh, important site, not just the altar of the ceremony of blessings and the curses, but also a temple, the first temple, the real first temple of the Israelites. So Tzvi, uh, we have, a, 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 I think, I believe- two. Yeah, let me get to these questions here. The uh, Janice uh, asked about the uh, in Mount Ebal and on Mount Ebal. On means on top of the mountain. There's, uh, we have that in the story of Elijah and the, and the Carmel that they talk about on top of the mountain. Whereas in is a very specific thing. It's not on top, it's not on the bottom, it's in, it's on, it's, and uh, the site, is in Mount Ebal, it's on a slope beneath the top. So it's an accurate description, and the fact that it was covered up all those years, it, there was no way that 600 years later, uh, people would have an idea about this site, about the geographic uh, specifics of this site. Now, were the remains of the, Zach asked about the, were the remains of the dump site large enough? Yes, to represent the a multi-yearly gener generation uh, place of, uh, yes, plenty of room. It was about uh, five meters square, which is a really, really nice big area uh, to dump heck of a lot of bones. Okay, anything else? Do we have anything else here? No? Yes, the scarab. Uh, placed certainly deliberately, I, I would say, because it was found inside one of these installations that Chai spoke about in the first week, one of these round stone uh, installations. So that, that shows that it was placed there deliberately. And if I recall correctly, it was the only thing found uh, upon excavating that particular installation, which even strengthens the... Uh, idea even more. No, no question it was deliberate. Okay, Tzvi, I think uh, this is uh, all the questions we have for now. So everybody, uh, you will have uh, Tzvi's contact information on the screen and we will also share it on the uh, weekly newsletter along with the recording of this amazing lecture by Tzvi. Thank you so much. I just want to add one more thing, Aaron. If people are really interested um, in the subject, I've written four articles that were published in uh, the site called thetorah.com. Um, and look up my name there, and they're, they're all there, and enjoy. OK, and we'll that. share the links uh, on the newsletter. And you also wrote a book uh, that uh, we will also share on that uh, newsletter. So um, that's great. And uh, reminder, uh, you know, we're about to end this amazing online course. I believe that we created an amazing community of Joshua's altar. So I'm really blessed to be able to, to be part of this. And uh, next, week, next week, I'll be uh, giving the last lecture about the three covenants of Sinai, the plains of Moab and Ibal, and putting them in an interesting context, interesting theory, uh, and I'm sure that you'll be uh, happy to to listen to it and attend. So uh, I'll see you next week at the last lecture of the Joshua's Altar online course. So again, thank you, Tzvi, and thank you all, and shalom and happy Hanukkah. Shalom, shalom to everyone.
שלום. שלום. תודה רבה. שלום.